Okay, so today we're talking more about our derivatives. We're going to go to section 5 of chapter 2, and as you can see on the screen, basic differentiation properties, basically other ways to find the derivative. So a little review, what we've hopefully we're good with, we're done with, is working with all of the, uh, the long definition of the derivative, this one right here. Okay, which you should have done multiple times in your homework. We had a whole lecture on this. Essentially, to find the derivative of a function, you plug in the x plus h. You get that first big result. Then you subtract the original function. You cancel a handful of terms. You divide everything by h. Then you set all the h is equal to 0 because that's the limit we're looking for. And you end up with some derivative. Okay? That's the long way, the basic way, the way that's always going to work. Now we're going to learn some shortcuts, some, some nice things we can do here. So some notations, and we've talked about this already. If you have a function right here, y equals f of x, then f prime of x is the derivative. You can also use this thing, which is a y prime. That little prime just means derivative. It's not a 1. It's like a quotation mark, a single apostrophe, or a, what do you call it, a possessive mark there. I guess apostrophe was right. You can use this phrase, dy dx. Now, we'll get into that a little bit more later on, but that just means the derivative with respect to x. But these are all identical things, which all mean the derivative. Same with this last one, d dx of f of x. That's essentially the command saying d, d over dx right here is saying take the derivative of this function. So it's doing this process that we've gone over before. So all these are the derivatives. Now, a couple things. This, again, these theorems are kind of awkward here, but if you have y equal to some c or f of x equal to c, some constant number, the derivative is always going to be 0. And, and quickly, I'll just kind of write that out here. If you've got a graph, I'm sorry. Okay, so if you have a function that looks like y equals 5, all right, remember the tangent line that we're looking for is going to be a place where you hit the graph kind of at the edge here, well, every single point that you pick, the tangent line is basically that one right there. What I want you to see is your slope is going to be zero. And that's what the derivative is. It's talking about the slope. When I have another function that's not a constant, remember a constant is what I just erased that horizontal line. You're always going to get a slope of zero. But if you had a function that say was a parabola like that, and I start looking at the slopes of the lines, well, that's a slope right there, which is definitely not a zero. Here's a slope for this point right there. Here's another line that's tangent, and that one has a slope. There's a bunch of different lines that are tangent. Every one of them has their own slope. And the derivative is our formula that's telling us all these different slopes. They're all different. You have different slopes. There's, there's thousands, millions, an infinite number of them. That derivative that you find is the formula that says, okay, if I plug in this x value right here, if I plug that into the derivative right here, it won't be a zero, but whatever answer I get will be the slope of that tangent line right there. So think of the derivative, <clears throat> it's a formula to help you find the slope of every single tangent line. Okay, and that's what we're gonna be doing today. We're gonna be applying this concept and how to do it. So this formula is just saying, that if you have a constant function, whether it's y equals 5, y equals 3, y equals negative 8, every constant function, which is a horizontal line, they have a slope of 0, and it's going to be a 0 everywhere. The derivative will actually be 0. Okay, and that's going to come into play in our next step. Okay, So if we have something like this, f of x equals 10 pi uh, square, if you notice, that's not an x squared, that's a pi, that's always 3.4, 3.14 squared. So f of x, no matter what x is, it's always equal to 10 pi squared. That's what's known as a constant. So the slope is what's the change, okay? The, the, the change of the line. Well, guess what? The line's not changing at all. It's constantly being 10 pi squared. Therefore, the slope is zero. There is no change. So that's what we're going with right there. Now we get to the part that matters. <clears throat> if you have your function equal to any x with any power, this is important, k is a real number. So just to clarify, a real number could be positive, it could be negative, it could be fractions, decimals, square roots, anything. This is what's known as a power function. Just x to some power, any power. 
the good part is the derivative is very easy to figure out. Okay, and they even know it doesn't have to be an, uh, uh, an integer. It can be any number out there. So here's the formula. Okay, if you have a function equal to x to the n, now n is the mystery power. It could be a 2, 3, fraction, decimal, negative, whatever. The derivative, you can go right to it in one step. What it is is you take the old power, you multiply it in front, and then you subtract 1 from the power. That's how you find the derivative of something that is a power function. So here's an example f of x equals x to the sixth, or y equals x to the sixth. We want to find the derivative. Now, bear in mind, let me go back a couple slides, you can go to this formula right here. Remember how you plugged in x to the sixth? You plug in the x plus h to the sixth, and it's going to take a long time to foil that thing out. Then you subtract the x to the sixth, you divide everybody h, plug a zero in there, you're going to get a function answer, some sort of x in the result. It's going to take a long time to do that, but this is a shortcut, this theorem right here. It's a great thing that makes derivatives so much easier. So here's what you do. You take the old power, which is 6, you multiply it out front. That's why the 6 is right here. If I can show you that. Come on, right there. So you bring the old power out in front. And then you take the old power and you subtract it by 1 and you get a new power. That right there is a derivative. That's all it takes. It's, it's a literally a problem where you can do this, a lot of them at least, you can do them in your head. So no matter what the power is, you take that power, you multiply it out in front, and you subtract one from the power, the old power, and you get your answer. Okay, now we get some tricky ones here. Let, before I do this one though, let me just kind of do another one. Let's say we have x to the 10th, and we're trying to find the derivative of that. So same thing, you take the old power, multiply it out front, and then you take the, the old power and you subtract 1 from it, and that's how we get 10x to the ninth, and we're done. Okay, it's the same formula all the time, no matter what the power n is. Now, in if you remember that theorem, I'll go to the previous slide, the theorem is you have x to a power. As long as it's x to some power, you're fine. You can apply this concept. Now, when you look at this one, notice, I'm sure you all can tell, the x to the fifth is in the bottom. So how does that work? Well, what you're not going to do is this. I shouldn't even write it, but I'll just kind of put it out there. You don't take the derivative of the piece. If the, if the formula, or sorry, if the function was x to the fifth, then 5x to the fourth would be the derivative, but our function is not x to the fifth. The x to the fifth is on the bottom. What you have to do is, you have to rewrite this, I'm going to go back one more time, to look like this original piece right here. You have to have f of x equals an x to the n, not a fraction. No fractions, nothing like that. So how do we do that? Well, you remember the definition of what x to the fifth on the bottom means. It means x to the negative 5. Now it looks like that formula that we had a minute ago. Okay, We have a function equal to an x to some power, and as I told you in the beginning, that power can be anything, including, like in this case, a negative 5. So it may not seem as obvious, but we do the same rule. We take that x to the negative fifth. So we're not even looking at the fraction anymore. We're focusing just on that right there. So remember what we do. You take the old power, which is negative 5. You multiply that out in front, and then you subtract 1 from the power. So see what happens here. That negative 5 is right up here in front. And then the power, which is negative 5, you subtract 1 from that. Now, what a lot of people do is they make it a negative 4. You're not, that's not what you get when you subtract 1. When you take negative 5 minus 1, your new power here is going to be a negative 6. So my derivative is negative 5x to the negative 6. And then you can bring it back down if you want and call it negative 5 over x to the 6th. Same thing, okay? And I'm not going to say you have to do that. Some of your problems might say... Put it back, you know, get rid of that negative power. Either way, those two last answers are the same. But you have to convert it here to start. Then you apply the new rule that we just learned, the power. All right, <clears throat> now we get another weird one. We have function f of x equals the fourth root of x to the third. Well, just like the last time, that formula had nothing to do with roots, nothing to do with fractions. You have to get rid of those. And this is why we also know there is a way to rewrite this as a single power. 
Remember, when you have a root, you put that root power as a denominator power. The fourth root of x to the third is x to the three quarters. If that was a square root of x to the third, then this would be x to the three halves. But whatever that root power is, that's what goes in the bottom. And then, like before, we're now only focusing on that right there. That is what my function is equal to. So you can see it, x to the three quarters. And this is what we are going to take the derivative of using that new rule that we just learned, okay? x to the 3 quarters. We take the 3 quarters and we put it out front. No change there. The power was 3 quarters. We put that out in front of my function. So 3 quarters times the x never leaves. And then you take the old power, which is 3 quarters, and you subtract 1 from it. You always subtract 1. Whether it's a whole number, a fraction, a negative, positive, decimal, it doesn't matter. You always subtract 1 from the power. And then you just have to remember how to do this add subtract the fractions here, 3 quarters minus the number 1, get a common denominator if you have to, that's 3 quarters minus, minus 4 quarters, and that sure enough gives you, oops, minus 1 over 4, and that's how they arrived at this new power, negative 1 quarter. That's what they have. So your last part is, you can bring the x to the bottom and look carefully where they got this from. Okay, make sure you understand that, that the power that had a negative, the x was the thing that had a negative, not the 3, not the 4. The 3 and the 4 are already on the top and the bottom. And I'm talking about this part right here. 3 is on the top, 4 is on the bottom. x has a negative 1 quarter power, which we know is the same as putting an x to the positive 1 quarter on the denominator, hence that right here. And then the last part was they converted that to a fourth root to make it 4 fourth root of x. All right, and that's the simple step of how we can get our derivative using this power rule. And it keeps going on. Now, if you have a constant in front of a function, the constant really doesn't change anything. If it was just a constant, we already know the derivative is zero. But if you have just a constant in front of some sort of an x, you find the derivative of that piece, and then you just multiply the answer by whatever that constant was. So that's the fancy way what they're telling us. You'll see it in an example right here. We have 12x to the fourth. Okay, well, we know how to find the derivative of x to the fourth. You have a 12, just multiply the 12 out front, but it's even easier than that. What I do is, let's see if they do it the same way as me. Um, uh, what are we at here? Okay, they plugged in a bunch of different things here. They found the derivative, and they found it right down here. This is the derivative of x to the fourth. Remember, bring the 4, subtract by 1, and then you just multiply it by the 12 out front. That's how they get the 48x to the third. Um, me, when I do this, it's the same exact thing. I'm not going to say mine's better than what this is. But when I find the derivative, I just take that 4 and I multiply it right in front of that term and subtract 1. And then I still get the same answer of 48x to the third. Does not make a difference which way you go on this one. Okay, and, and even this step right here, some of you are saying, do I have to show the 4 times 12 and the 4 minus 1? No. In the beginning, I'm going to write this all out. You're going to see that explanation. But as you get better at these, you know 4 times 12 is 48. You just go right to the 48. You know when I subtract 1 from 4, it's 3. You go right to that. You can go right to the answer. And most of these, you know, except for those ugly fraction ones or sometimes with the negative ones, you might need to show a little more work. But if you're dealing with just regular numbers and regular powers, by all means, jump right to the solution if you see the derivative. And my rule that I tell every student, whether it's in class or online, is as long as you're getting the right answer, you don't need to show all those steps. If you're feeling, though, that more is necessary to show than, or to help you understand, then yes, you should do it. But for now, you don't need to. All right, if you have multiple terms, now, again, this, this is kind of confusing. You'll see the example in a second. All it means is take the derivative of each individual term. Well, here's it in English. We have a function equal to 3x to the third plus 11x squared. Find the derivative. Just go take the derivative of each piece. That's all you have to do. So the derivative of each, take the first one. We take this 3, multiply it out front. 3 times 3 is a 9. Subtract 1 from the power. Now you're down to a square. That's it for the first term. 3x cubed, the derivative is 9x squared. For this 11x squared, multiply the front by 2, that's a 22, subtract 1 from the power, now you have x to the first, 9x squared plus 22x, that is the derivative of this original function. 
Okay, now we start, of course, like always, it's, it starts basic, then they're going to start making it a little bit more complicated, but we can do this. They want us to find the derivative of this function. Okay, so what we're going to do here first is this is only going to work if we have one term on the bottom. So when I have multiple terms on top, I don't care if I have one, two, three, or ten terms on top. As long as I have one term on the bottom, then I can do this. But if this was an x to the sixth plus seven, or an x to the sixth plus two x, I can't do what I'm doing here. I have to do another technique. <clears throat> Excuse me, but this one, we can do it. When it's just one term, that's the key. You split this up into multiple fractions. All right, so you take this, and now notice, this is just the, uh, um, sorry, the, the regular function. So I take this function, I rewrite it as the first term over x sixth minus the second term over x sixth. And, and I like to show people, it's just like when you have these fractions right here. Okay, we know the answer is going to be 3 sevenths. What we did to get there is we have 1 plus, we add them up with the common denominator, and we say 1 plus 2 over 7, that's going to give us the 3 over 7 right there. Okay, so that's the, the, the thing we're doing is we're going to go backwards from this step, and we split it into two fractions. That's how they got this right here. Okay, so just make sure you, you see that and you get where, how they're splitting it into two. If you have one term, you can rewrite this as multiple fractions. They all have to have the same denominator. That's the big key there. As long as they have the same denominator, you're fine. And then they cleaned up each individual de denominator. That first one didn't change. It's still 3 over x squared. I meant each individual fraction. The second one, we know this from basic algebra right here, x3 over x6 is a single 1 over x to the third. So this is our new function. And again, this is not the answer. All this is me just rewriting the function. And then I'm going to rewrite it again. Okay, now this, this part, I don't feel this is necessary. You don't need to say, okay, we're taking the derivative of each. Once I see this, I know I'm going right to the derivative. But first, what I would do, and, and they did skip a part that I want. Here's what I'll do. This is where we're at right now. We have 3 over x sixth minus 1 over x third. Sorry if that's getting kind of tight. Then I like to take the function again and rewrite it as 3x to the negative 6 minus x to the negative 3. Make it look like a single x with a single power. That's the part they did right here. I like to do it earlier. I like to do it while it's still a function. Now, I find the derivative, and I also like to work down, by the way, one step at a time. Every time I write the f of x, f of x, or an f prime of x, I'm not a big fan of this working left to right kind of thing. The only reason they're doing it here in the PowerPoint slides is it's a little bit easier to type up, and it's a little bit easier to, you know, to, to get all the steps in, but the way on the right, I like this better, me personally. Now let's make sure we follow the rules. Remember, we take the negative 6, the old power, multiply it by 3, that gives me a negative 18. I then subtract one from the old power. So remember, that's negative six minus one. That gives me a negative seven. And then do the same thing on the next term for the derivative. Negative three times a negative gives me a positive three. And then subtract one from three, negative three, and you get a negative four. And that's how we got the same answer right here, okay? Now the last part, I'm not going to say it's the most necessary, but it's, it's worthwhile noting. You know, if I'm giving you a, a paper test in class, I would say you're done right here on this step that we just finished, right here. Okay? However, when you're doing this online, you're taking tests and quizzes online, they're, they're going to make you know an answer in every possible way, and a lot of this is going to be cleaning it up and trying to get a nice... A pretty answer, if you want to call it that. So they, they then rewrote, they found the derivative. So this is where we're at right now, what I have boxed. Then they said, okay, negative powers, let's go move these back down to positive powers in the denominators. And then they went and found a common denominator. Now remember, when you find a common denominator, this is a 7, this is a 4. i got to put another 3x's down here to make an x to the 7. So I put another 3x's up on top. That's where they got the 3x cubed minus 18 over 7. 
that's a derivative, that's a derivative, they're all the same, okay? But like I said, in some of your homework problems, they may say, give me the answer in simplified form with no negatives. So you gotta know to do the last step there. Sometimes they're gonna say it's okay to have negatives, it just kinda depends on the problem. So like, that, like always, make sure you read the rules carefully, make sure you understand what is being asked before you just enter it, especially when it's a quiz because you don't have a second try or a third try or a redo. That's it for the quiz. All right, applications for instantaneous velocity. Now remember, instantaneous velocity is basically what is the slope of the tangent line at a given x, at a given mark, okay? So an object moves along the, x the y-axis, sorry, marked in feet, so that its position in time x in seconds is that formula right there. So they're asking, what's the instantaneous velocity function for v? Essentially, in English, they want to know what is the derivative here, okay? So the derivative of the position function with respect to time. So what they're doing, and I'm kind of, again, I don't like this, this part that they're doing right here in the middle. This is my own little preference. I don't care for that. I like to just go right to that answer right there. So look at our function right here. Multiply the three out front, drop the power by one, you get three x squared. In the second term, you get a negative, a two times a negative six, that's a negative 12, and you get an x. Drop one, from two minus one. In the last one, remember, this nine x right here, so we're clear, that's like there's a one right there. So we get a nine times one, which is nine, and when you subtract one from the power, you get a zero. X to the zero power, I hope you all remember, is just a one, it's just nothing, the x disappears. So we get just a plain nine right there. So this is my derivative. That's the answer to the question that they wanted is what's the derivative? When they ask for instantaneous velocity, they want you to find the derivative of the position function, the original function that was given right there. Okay, now I think it's the same problem. Yeah, same problem. Now they want you to find the velocity at x equals two and x equals five seconds. Now remember, like that example of dropping something off the, the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the speed, the velocity, when you first drop it is not that much, but by the time it hits the ground, it's moving a lot faster. So at two seconds, you're gonna get a certain speed, like just imagine, whatever this item is, you're hitting it with a radar gun, it might be going a certain speed at two seconds, and at five seconds, it'll be going a completely different speed, so you, they don't even have a relationship. But what you have to do is, you gotta go find the velocity. The velocity function is the derivative that we just found, okay? The instantaneous velocity function. So we, we're going to use that derivative, and we plug in the 2 into the derivative, and then we start the problem again and plug in a 5 to the derivative. So when you plug in a 2, don't forget how to do the order of operations. Make sure you square it, then multiply it, then subtract it. And we get 12 minus 24 plus 9. We have a negative 3. Now remember... The object is moving up and down the y-axis. So when something's moving negative three, it's moving down the y-axis is what it's saying. Okay, it's dropping. And that's probably a function that's doing this. At some point, it's moving down right here. It's moving up over here. It's not moving up or down right there. And it's moving down. Then all of a sudden, it's going back up over here. But at the exact moment, when the x is two, the speed, the the actual velocity at that point is negative three, in this case, feet per second. Okay, so to answer it correctly, because they're talking about feet is the y-axis, time is the x-axis, negative three feet per, per second. Now we do it again with the five. Go back to the same derivative function, the velocity function that we found, plug in the five, and now we get a 24. That means it's going up at a rate of 24 feet per second. And that's our one way of you know plugging in to find the velocity. Now, doing it again, we have the same thing right here, same formula. Now they wanna know a time, an x. Because remember, time is x in this case. They wanna know when the velocity is zero. Now what that means is, remember, we're measuring it as you go up and down the y-axis. Now this is what my formula looks like. It's, it's about like this. So it's just imagine it's like an object traveling this way. And what I'm measuring is kind of like your altitude. How up or down are you going? So remember, at this point, it was going downward, which makes sense. It's like a ball rolling down a hill. 
and then over here it's going upward. Okay, so they're talking about these velocities, and remember, you're going up, 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 and then if, if you're just looking at in respect to the y-axis, you know, I'm measuring the altitude. It's getting higher, 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 higher. It's, it's increasing, and then all of a sudden it hits this spot right here, and then it starts decreasing because it's going down. It's losing elevation. Then it hits this point right here, and then it starts going up. Well, if you're measuring it like a radar gun measuring up and down, when it hits the top of these valleys, or sorry, these hills and the bottoms of these valleys, that's the spot where the velocity is actually nothing. And remember what instantaneous velocity is, it's a slope. Remember over here at 2, the slope was negative 3. Over here at 5, the slope was like 24 or something. It's the slope of the tangent line. So when they want to know when the instantaneous velocity is 0, that's going to tell you when the slope of the tangent line is also 0. That's going to tell us the tops and bottoms of the hills and valleys. Now they're directly asking us, what is the instantaneous, find the times when the instantaneous velocity is zero. So we still go get the derivative, which we already did. That's the velocity function. But the difference is, you're going to set the derivative equal to zero. Instead of the other time where we were plugging in a number for x, remember how we would plug in x equals 2, x equals 5? We're not doing that this time. We're setting the whole derivative equal to zero, and we're going to solve that. So this function right here, we're setting this thing equal to zero, and this is where you have to remember your old algebra. Factor out a three, you have an x squared minus four x plus three. Factor that, you get an x minus one, x minus three, and you set each equal to zero, and you get the answers of one and three. And that's telling you at x equals one and x equals three, those are the tops and the bottoms. That's gonna be the name of the game that we're gonna be doing with all of our derivatives, we're gonna be finding where our graph is hitting these peaks and valleys. And the way we do that is we find the derivative, we set the derivatives equal to zero, and that's gonna tell us our magic spot where it's gonna happen, what x's will make this happen. Okay, so now we're gonna, uh, example of tangent line. So we have a problem right here. We have a function, I'm sorry, a cube function. We wanna first find the derivative. So now we know the shortcut, it's very easy. All right, again, I don't like this part. Just go right to this one. So notice from the derivative, sorry, from the original function right here, 3x cubed, the derivative is 9x squared. The derivative of negative 2x squared is negative 4x. And then the derivative of 5, that was our very first thing of the day. That's a constant. Anytime you take the derivative of a constant, it's gone. It's nothing over here. It's a big zero. So that's gone. So that's step one, we find the derivative. Now, we got that, yeah, that 9x squared minus 4x. And now at this point, we're gonna find the equation of the tangent line when x equals one. Okay, so we don't have the function, but I'll just kind of tell you how this function looks. It looks something, I don't know, like that. Okay, and what they're saying is, and I don't know where we're at here, let's just say this is one, x equals one, they're saying there's a tangent line right here. What's the equation of that line? Okay, so we don't know much about it. We just know that it's touching our graph right here, and we know that it's, sorry, x equals one, and we know it's a tangent line, so it's touching it. It has a slope, it has a point. We, we gotta find all that. So here's what we do. First off, you plug in the one to the original function right here. Because when you plug in one, it's going to tell you the y value and you're going to know that coordinate. In this case, it's a 1 comma 6. This is all from the original function right here. Okay, if you want an actual point, you plug in to the original function like you've done for many semesters of algebra. When you want to plug in something to the derivative, remember that's not giving you a point or a coordinate, that's going to tell you the slope of the tangent line. So know what these two things do. So we have the point at 1 comma 6. That's this point right here where it's touching our graph. Now, we know a point, we just have to find the slope. That's where the derivative comes into play. You, you plug in 1 to the derivative function right over here. Now, you plug 1 into that, and that's going to tell you a slope. And let me get rid of this. 
that slope is 5, that's what the derivative tells you. That means right here, this line that's tangent has a slope of 5. Okay, and if you think about what we talked about last week now, the question, and, and they didn't really say it, just so we're clear, they want you to find the equation of the tangent line. So if you want to find that, you use either the, the slope-intercept form or the point-slope form. Since we have a point, but it's not the y-intercept, we have to use the point-slope form right here. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. We know the slope is 5. Just found that. We know the point is 1, 6, and we plug those into that formula that I have right here. So y minus 6 equals 5 times x minus 1, something you've done many times in algebra, and you clean it up a little bit. You know, y minus 6 equals 5x minus 5. Move the 6 over. You get y equals 5x plus 1. And, oh, go back. That is the slope of this line right over here that we are trying to find. y equals 5x plus 1. Okay, so now we have a different function. It's the same kind of thing here. The derivative of f, or sorry, we have a function. 3x cubed minus, sorry, was it the same function? Yeah, same function. Go back. The derivative was 9x squared minus 4x. We found that. The tangent line we found, y equals 5x plus 1. Now they want to find the values of x where the line is horizontal. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. So to find out where the tangent line is horizontal, and I like to draw the pictures just so you can kind of see, okay? Right here you get a horizontal tangent line, right here, those maxes and mins, a horizontal tangent line means slopes are zero. And that's always the most important tangent lines that we're gonna need to find. So think tangent line has to do with the derivative. We've got the derivative, nine x squared minus four x. We wanna know what x is make this thing equal to zero. Well, how do we do it? We just set that whole thing equal to zero and we solve for x. So, 9x squared minus 4x equals zero. Always factor first if you can. I can pull out an x and then I can't factor anymore so we set that equal to zero, we set that equal to zero and you get x equals zero and x equals positive four ninths. Those are the places where you're gonna get horizontal tangent lines, and you're going to learn soon, those are going to be our special points, our maximums and minimums on a curve, what we need to maximize profit or to minimize cost or whatever it might be. That's where this comes into play. Okay, so we get that. Now we're going to spend the rest of the time going over as much homework as we can here. The homeworks, I'm going to say, if you look at all these examples, and I've told you this a couple times ago, and I tell my classes always this, the calc is not difficult. Look at this entire problem right here. The calculus, I'll tell you, was this new thing I taught you with the derivatives. Multiplying the power in front and dropping the power. Everything else that took work was the cleaning up. The algebra, the simplifying, the factoring, the solving, or cleaning up a problem to make it ready to take the derivative. The calc stuff is easy. It's the algebra that you have to, to really work on. That's the part that is the, the core of these problems here. Okay, so now let's look at some problems here. All right, let's start with this number three. So in this particular case, we have you, they want, all they want you to do is rewrite this using negative exponents. Well, when you have a 1 over z, it's like a 1 over z to the first. That's just going to be a z to the negative 1 on top. That's to get you ready to take the derivative. So some of these, like I said, are going to be very easy. Some of them will take a little bit more time. But they're just getting you to kind of refresh your memory on the algebra here, things you've had before. All right, now remember I told you this notation means take the derivative of this piece. So the rule is you take this make this a little bit bigger, see if that'll help you guys. Okay, so remember the rule. You have x to the ninth. That's all we're working on right here is x to the ninth. The rule is you take that nine, you put it out front, you take the power and you subtract one from it, so that's going to give you a power of eight. And just to be clear, I'm sure you guys have done this enough times, but let me make sure. I'm using the shift six to put that little caret symbol and that automatically makes it happen. Or you can hit this button 
right here, down here, and that puts a power up there. Oops, sorry. Hit the X, then hit that button, and it just lets you put the power right there, and you can put the 8 in. Either way, you get the same answer. Okay, so now we're going to go up to, let's see, let's try number 11. They want us to find the derivative of, here's the function, f of x equals 8x to the 8th, the derivative of that. So you bring the 8 up front and multiply to the other 8, you get a 64. You take your power and you subtract 1 from it. And remember, you see, the x has to be here. It's not 64 to the 7th. It's still an x. Everything revolves around this x. It's 64x to the 7th. Okay, so like I said, there's not a lot of writing on this first few, but that's going to change in a couple problems. Okay, number 15. We want to find the derivative of this. Well, negative 8x minus 9, you treat this as two individual terms. The x right here, so you can see this, this is just like me saying negative, so this right here, negative 8x, is exactly the same as negative 8x to the first. Okay, that's not a derivative, that's me rewriting what it means. Now I can apply my derivative rule. So if this is my y, that's still my y. Now I get the y prime, so I get 1 times negative 8 is a negative 8. Bring your power down. 1 minus 1 is a 0, and then you better remember your rules of exponents that say x to the 0 is like nothing at all. It's just a negative 8. And then the second term right here, the derivative of negative 9, that is a constant. So the derivative of a constant is going to be nothing. This entire thing right here, this is my derivative. Okay? So like on all these, like always we do, pause if you need to look at this again, reread it, you'll see the exact similar type of problems when you're doing these yourself. Okay, let's jump to number 19 and see what it's all about. Okay, same thing. Now, they want you to find h prime of t, find the derivative if this is my original function. Now, I'm just going to write this out a little bit more larger so we can see it. We have 7.3 minus 6.1t plus 0.2t squared. Now, notice, you may notice that the, uh, the problem is not in descending order. Usually, you have the higher power in front and you end with a constant later. That doesn't matter for a derivative because the rule for a derivative is you find each individual derivative. It's like it's three mini problems in one. One term has nothing to do with the other when you're looking for a derivative. So our first piece, 7.3, the derivative of a constant is nothing. This one right here, when it's a power of 1, remember, you just take the number, the coefficient, and the t just drops off. So two of your easy derivatives. And then over here, you multiply the 2 times 0.2, and that gives you a 0.4, and then your power drops by 1 to give you a single t. And I'm going to guess that you could type this, and of course you don't need the 0, so we can do negative 6.1 plus 0.4t, or you can just do 0.4t minus 6.1. Either should work. The order doesn't matter, as you've learned many times. So I think I typed it in right, and there is our derivative. Let's give a look at number 23. Okay, in this case now, the notation's kind of awkward, but the, what you should be noticing is those are both t's in the denominator, okay, in each case. So h of t equals 8 t to the 2 thirds minus 5 t to the 1 fourth. So your first step, you got to get this looking like a regular power, okay? No, no powers on the bottom, no roots. And we did this a couple times earlier. The solution is you can just bring this up, and now it becomes a negative power, the definition of a negative power. Over here, same thing. What I don't want you to think is, okay, these negatives are going to cancel. No, negative power means one thing, and negative in the front means something else. That, that doesn't cancel and become a, a positive one-fourth right here. So don't make anything cancel. Now we apply our derivative rule, so notice this is the step where I now have a derivative. Okay, the first two are identical, but now it's a derivative. So I'm going to take negative two-thirds, multiply that by eight, and the t, I'm going to take the negative two-thirds, and I'm going to subtract one from it. 
and I do the same thing over here. I take the negative one-fourth, that's going to multiply by the negative five out front, and the t, I have negative one-fourth, and again, the rule is you subtract by one. Okay, just give me some more space to write here. Now, I'm just cleaning up. This is more algebra here. So negative two-thirds times eight looks like it's a negative sixteen-thirds. The t, remember, this is negative two-thirds minus one. If you need to do what I'm doing off the side, please do. Get your common denominator. Negative one is like negative three over three, and now I get a negative five-thirds. Okay, that's my power right there. And then on the second term, we have negative one-fourth times negative five, so that's going to be a positive five-quarters. And we have a t to the negative five-quarters. And if you're not sure how I got that one, remember, negative one-fourth minus one, get a common denominator, which is four over four. That is where I get the negative five-quarters right there. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at that. Okay, here's our problem. So now we gotta plug this in. Now this is the part where it didn't specifically say how to answer it. So I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna be guessing and we're gonna learn from this and see if they like it or not, like my answer or not. So I have my negative 16 thirds. T to the negative 5 thirds plus 5 quarters t to the negative 1, sorry, negative 5 quarters. All right, now, like I said, if this is a test problem, I would be fine with that one. Yeah, that should work, but I'm not sure how finicky your, this system's gonna be. So I'm gonna try it out, and then if it doesn't work, we're gonna, I'll make some adjustments here. Yeah, and it's gonna count it. So. Remember I was saying earlier they made us simplify. Unless they give you that instruction, I think they're going to be fairly open on what you can answer. But we'll get to more cleaning up later when they get more specific here. So that's that particular problem right there. Let's look at number 27. Okay. Object moves along the y-axis marked in feet, like the one we did earlier, and the time is in seconds on the x-axis, and it's given by this function here on the top. Number one, now, okay, so they say part A, find the instantaneous velocity function. So remember, instantaneous velocity is the derivative. So I'm taking the derivative of this function right here. So this is a 3x squared minus a 30x plus a 72. Now pause for a second, make sure you understand where I got all three of those terms from while I'm punching this here into the system. Wanna make sure you understand every negative, why that x is gone on the last term, why the, you know, this, this x went from a square down to a one, or are we clear on every one of these? That's what I wanna make sure of. Okay, now part B, the velocity of an object at x equals one is this many feet per second. Well, remember, they already said it, in case you forgot, or in case they didn't tell you, when you take the derivative of a position function, that's what this is, it's telling you the position. Taking the derivative is gonna tell you the speed, the velocity. That's the instantaneous velocity function, v equals f prime of x. So we take this function, we're gonna plug in one to it. That's what I'm doing over here on part b. I'm finding f prime of one. So we replace every x with a one, just like you normally would in any other function, and that will tell us our speed at that given moment. So it looks like we get 42.45, and that's how many feet per second it is going. All right, part C. The velocity is zero at how many seconds? So notice, when they tell you what the x is, they're looking for the velocity. Okay, this is the velocity right here. The, this will tell you velocity. If they're telling you the velocity is zero, that's when you set the equation equal to zero here. 
right there. And now we have to solve for x. Well, first thing is always factor out that make the, a common factor that makes it easier to deal with your problem. And now we say 3 times x minus 6 and x minus 4. So now we set each factor equal to 0. Now, to be clear, this is setting every factor equal to 0 because that 3 is actually a factor. But now when we solve for x, there's no x's here. That's why that first piece doesn't have a, a solution. It's not negative 3. There is no x. If you were to pull an x out here, like say right here, then there would be an answer, but there's no x that got factored out. So only solve the equations that have an x. x equals 6, x equals 4. Those are the places where your velocity is at 0. So 4 and 6 are our, are our solutions. Okay. So hopefully that was clear. I'll go back just in case you need to pause and look at the work. So go ahead and pause it if you need to see any more on this one, and then I'll clean it up now. All right. Let's see what number 31, I believe, is our next one in this section. Okay. Find the derivative of this. We've done this as well. Follow the rules. We're looking for the derivative of 18x plus 26 over x. Now, as I told you, as long as that bottom is one term like it is, you can split this into two fractions, both of them over that single term. Okay. Now, if you had a problem like this, there is no splitting up you can do. There is no two fraction things because there's two terms down here. It's only when there is one term. And that term could have a power. It could have a number multiplying in front of it. But if there's any more adding or subtracting on the bottom, you can't do it. So now we clean this up a little bit, and this is what I get. So again, pause it if you need to and look at that. Make sure you see where I got the 18 and the 26x negative 1 from. Now, so we're clear. This is what I'm trying to find the derivative of. Well, I rewrote it as this and as this. Keep in mind, these are all the same as the original problem. I have not done the derivative yet. I've just rewritten it. Now I find the derivative. And the derivative of 18 is 0. The derivative of 26x to the negative 1, remember you bring the negative 1 and multiply it to the 26. And negative 1 minus 1, let's go ahead and put that there so you can see it. My derivative is negative 26, sorry, negative 26, x to the negative 2. And that's our derivative. That's the answer to this entire question. Now, again, I'm, I'm kind of playing around with this to make sure you, it didn't say I couldn't use a negative power, so I'm going to go with that. If it marked it wrong for whatever reason, then maybe I would rewrite this bottom as negative 26 over x squared and try that one. Okay, but I, I usually think they're not going to be that picky when they do these problems, when they have the answer key. Okay, so again, check this over, pause it if you need to before we go on to the next one, then unpause it and resume. All right, let's do another one here. Let's get to number 35. I think we're getting a word problem, right? Good. Marine manufacturer will sell NX power boats. Okay, so that's our Y. That's our function. You see it going up the graph on the right? This is N of X over here. All right, and that's what the function is. And X is the number of dollars down here, thousands of dollars spent on advertising. That's your X. X dollars. All right, so now we have our formula. All this, and it's only going to apply between x for between $5,000 and $30,000, but that doesn't matter right now. Let's find the n prime of x. Let's find the derivative. So that's the only thing we're looking for right now here. We have n of x equals 980 minus 3720 over x. Okay, so like before, let's get rid of this just to get more space to, to work. First step, they want us to find the derivative. So look at that and follow your rules. Just because this is a word problem doesn't mean the rules are different. It's the same thing. I'm going to do a rewrite. Not doing the derivative yet. 
let's just bring that x so it's a normal power, and it's very simple, you just make it a negative one. Now is when the derivative comes into play. So the derivative of 980 is zero, and then over here we get a 3720 because it's negative one times the negative 3720, and don't make that x go away. Remember, it's minus one. The power was minus one, I subtract one from it, now it's a negative two, and it's kind of like this, 3720 over x squared. Both are good. Okay, we saw a second ago, it's going to be fine if you, uh, oops, sorry. It's going to be fine if you plug in this one, I don't know if you can see it, with a negative 2, or I'll try the other one in this case. Let's try the 3720 over the x squared. Both should work, though whether you do the negative two power or you do this fraction. And we're good there. Now they want to know n, uh, n prime of 10. So we just go to this equation right here and we plug in the 10. We get 3720 over 100. And they want you to type in an integer or a decimal. And this is also key. Make sure you look at the instructions. So I'm just going to go to my calculator and literally punch in these two numbers. 3720 divided by 100, and yes, I know a lot of you can just do that in your head, that's fine. Go ahead and plug that in. So we get 37.2, and there's our answer there. Now, now, so we're clear, let me go back to what we just found. Remember, this, this is the, uh, the graph. So let me circle a few things to highlight. That right there is the original function, that one. That's giving us this graph right here. Okay, it's telling you, give me a number of dollars, I'll tell you how many boats we're gonna sell. It's gonna go exactly based on that. The derivative we found right here, that's telling you the formula. Remember, derivative is the formula for the slope of every tangent line or the speed at every time. Now, in this case, what speed are we talking about? What it's basically is saying is, what's the ratio of boats per dollar? spent. How is that going to be looking? You know, what's, how is it going to be rising? So if I take right here or right here, at any given point, I can get the tangent line. So the question they just asked was at 10, n prime of 10. So here's 10 right here. At this dot where the graph has 10, there's a tangent line right here. They were asking what was the slope of that. That's what we found right here with this 37.2. Okay, it's saying that the increasing amount of boats being sold is going to be 32.7 boats per essentially every dollar of or every thousand dollars worth of um, uh, spending, the advertising dollars. But that's the rate. Now, as we start going further over here, you can see it's going to be a smaller slope, it's still positive, but you're going to get less boats per dollar. Whereas over here, it's going to make a huge difference. You're going to get high slopes. And you think about it, if any of you have been in business or know anything about the business here, when you're first starting off, those, those advertising dollars are going to make a huge difference and it's going to, you're going to see a huge increase early on in your sales. Then it starts to plateau and, and it starts to flatten out because you kind of reached everybody. You know, Just putting out five, one commercial is going to make a huge difference. Putting out 10 versus 20 commercials, by the time you're up there, it's not really going to change much. It's like it's either known or people aren't going to go to it. It's one or the other. Okay, so that being said, just want to make sure you know what we found there. Now, oh, and that's what they're asking here on part C. So we are okay with that. Now, interpret that. So they're saying at the $10,000 level of advertising, which is what we're showing here in this picture, sales are increasing at a rate of 37.2 boats per thousand spent on advertising. Well, that's a good sounding answer, kind of what I just said. Or at the 37.2 thousand level of advertising, sales are increasing at a rate of this. Now remember, when you plug n of something, it's n of x. Okay, x we already talked about is the advertising dollars. So the 10 is our advertising dollars. The 3720 is something different. So it's definitely not this part b because it's not. You know, we're not finding the level of advertising. We knew the level of advertising was 10,000. Okay, same thing on part C. A marine manufacturer will sell 10 power boats. No, it's not 10 boats. That X, well, you got to know what your variable stand for. And it even says it in the very top, X thousand dollars on advertising. So the 10 is only to do with advertising. So 
D is also one that's kind of close where it says the manufacturer will sell 37.2 power boats after spending $10,000. All right, the $10,000 is correct in this one. That part I'll say is yes, but the 37.2 power boats, okay, go back to the graph. This is the one that's going to tell us what we sell per, and I'm going to erase this. So if I plug in 10 to the original function over here, it gives me like 620-ish. We can actually find it if we needed to. That's how many boats you're going to sell. Okay? That's what part D there trying to allude to. You're not selling 37.2 power boats. That is your velocity. I'm not of the power boat, but that's how fast the rate of selling is. Every thousand dollars is getting you about 37.2 power boats sold. Not the, the actual number of boats, it's what you're increasing by. So remember, it's the rate, it's the slope, that's what your derivative is saying. So not D, but A is the best looking answer, but like always, check all of them, and we're good there. Okay, did I miss one here? I did miss some parts, I'm sorry. Okay, now they want us to find N prime of 20. Now, I erased my items, so let me just go back and get that derivative up on the screen. It's the good news about having to find the derivative first. It's right there. So remember, n prime of x equals 3720 over x squared. Now, in part d, they're asking us to find n prime of 20. So we already talked about when it was, go back one step, when you sold when you made, sorry, $10,000 worth of advertising, you're gonna be selling about 37.2 boats per thousand of advertising, per 1,000. Now we're gonna even do more advertising, and so that gives us 3220 divided by 400. So, use the calculator again and see what's this new slope, this new rate right here. So we have our 37, 20 divided by 400, and you'll see we have a slope of 9.3, okay? So what that means is we're not selling as many boats per thousand dollars. Back at the, the, the first problem we did, when we, plugged, when we had $10,000 worth of spending, that broke down to be about 37 boats per thousand dollars we spent on advertising. Now, when we spend more on advertising, we're only getting about 9.3 per thousand. So you see how the rate's not as good, the rate of return. That's something you're going to hear. What's the cost benefit here? What's the, is it worth it to advertise is what a company is going to ask themselves. And they may look at this and say, you know what? We spent this much and we spent some more. We're going to make a little bit more money, but our dollar is not going as far. So that's what it's saying. So select the correct choice. At the $20,000 level of advertising, sales are increasing at a rate of 9.3 boats per sale on advertising. That sounds good, but I'm not done yet. Let's look at them all. At 20,000 level of advertising, the sales are decreasing. Okay, now notice it's not decreasing. Our slope, what is it, that 9.3, it's still increasing. The slope is still going up, so it's not gonna be B. Let's look at C. The marine manufacturer will sell 20 boats. I'm gonna stop right there because the 20 was an X, which is advertising dollars, it's never about how many boats. Look at what it is. You're replacing X with 20. X is down here, it's advertising dollars. This is boats, so this is definitely wrong. And on the last one here, it will sell how many boats with $20,000 advertising. Well, we can find that. If I wanna know how many boats we sell with 20,000, I go to our first formula, I plug in 20, and that's gonna tell me exactly how many boats we anticipate selling. It has nothing to do with the derivative. The derivative is this first one that says, when you're spending $20,000 of advertising, your sales will be increasing at a rate of 9.3 boats per thousand dollars spent on advertising. Okay, that's our answer. And now we go to our part five. What's the instantaneous rate of change of pulse, of pulse rate? I'm sorry, did I get all five parts back here? I guess I did, I'm sorry. Yeah, all five parts, so we're done there. Okay, this next one's gonna be another one like yours. I'll, I'll skip that one. Let me look at number 30. Yeah, now we're in 2.6, so I'm gonna hold off on these until next class. 
But if you look at what we've done so far, let me get a summary here. So just while I'm doing this, quick reminder, your quiz is due, your chapter, oh, where are we at here? Your quiz four is due the night of Valentine's Day. Sorry about that. Right at midnight. Make sure you get that in. Remember, that has to be submitted by then. This lecture that I'm doing right now is out of section 2.5. So if you look at all the homework, we've pretty much done a good chunk of them right here. You should be able to do these other three out of four here, and, and including the ones that we've done as well. And then next, next time I'll record, we'll talk about section 2.6. We'll do these last six problems or so, and that should wrap it up right there. So that'll be it. Um, like always, get your quiz done on by Monday night, and email me if you have any questions.